We do all kinds of things here at Word in Your Ear. Video casts like this. Podcasts like this. Crowdcast events with famous authors. Live quizzes. And we can guarantee to make your next birthday one you'll never forget. There's only one way to guarantee getting all of this, to getting it before anybody else, and that's to sign on to be a supporter on Patreon. Full details at this address. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view. Well, welcome to another Word in Your Attic, our first of 2021. Happy New Year. And we are absolutely delighted uh, to be joined by someone who describes himself on Twitter as singer, songwriter, producer, composer, director, etc. I've conducted more orchestras than you can shake a stick at. Excellent. A tremendous <laughs> Very good. Mike Bat. Fantastic, Hello. Mike. Lovely to see you. Welcome aboard. Where, so where are you now? Where, 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 where are we talking to you? Um, I'm in um, just on the edge of Wimbledon, would you believe? <laughs> Uh, yes. Which That's we'll get on to later. That's too good. Are you Wimbledon. overground or underground? <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm overground, uh, but I'm very nearly underground, actually. All oh, right, this is all this is all coming I mean, together. I picked this place because it's nearly underground, funny enough. Um, Perfect. And, and the point is, um, I just moved here, um, literally as COVID was slamming in in the earlier part of what will now be last year. Yeah. And uh, so we just arrived, I mean, literally, people were refusing to do re deliveries and, and, and removals. So one van, you know, and I've got a lot of stuff in storage. And so my attic as such is uh, empty, but I've got lots of, um, I actually had to dig around yesterday to find some attic-y type of stuff for you. And I found uh, quite, you know, you end up, you know how you find an old diary and you sit there, um, if you, particularly if you're tidying up, and I, I don't know it happens with you, but you know, I'll be sitting there. It didn't happen yesterday, but because we weren't tidying up, but I know you find something and you start looking through it, and, you, and my wife will say, "You're not supposed to be looking through it, or you're supposed to be tidying it up." Oh, uh, this is it. It's a complete <laughs> distraction, isn't it? It's a rabbit hole <laughs> back into yeah, your past. Absolutely. <laughs> Which is precisely what we're going to do now. So there yeah, we exactly. are. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Very good work. Excellent. Well, look, we, I mean, we normally start, don't we, Dave, by asking people if they can remember what item, uh, what equipment, what record playing equipment they had in their home when they were growing uh, up. I think you were in, were you in Southampton? Where were you born? Yes, I was born in Southampton, but at six months old, I took a decision to leave. And All right. uh, we, we went uh, to Eastbourne then. And yeah. then from Eastbourne, we went to York, where my younger brother was born. Um, I've been all over the place. So then we went to Coventry because um, my dad was a civil engineer, and every time he every time he saw in the paper a job that was available that might move him a, a rung up the ladder, we'd move, you know, two hundred miles somewhere. What kind of what kind of record player was in your house when you were a child? We had an old gramophone. Was the first thing I remember uh, with a you know a horn. Uh, yeah. Again, bought in a junk shop. And we used to buy, or the, it probably came with some, and we used to pick up other ones at junk sales, um, the 78. So we, I had a pile of George Formby records. They were great. Oh, I mean, wow. George Formby, I thought was fabulous. And I even got a little plastic ukulele and learned, you know, you only had to learn three note chords to be able to play pretty much anything he wrote. What a lyricist, my goodness. I know. When I'm cleaning windows, genius. When I'm cleaning windows and then, Oddball ones I've even looked on the complete George Formby, it's not enlisted, one called uh, Dan the Dairy Man. All oh, right. Uh, I'm Dan the Dairy Man. Uh, I may go round and round, my round but I'm always on the square. And it was the odd bit of Caruso. Um, uh, who else? Um, I'm just talking about the odd bit of you know the yeah. hi ho hi ho it's tough to work we go that from yeah. disney or crackly yeah. and, it, and then it would slow down and you'd have to wind it up again yeah <laughs> can you that remember was, the first was, singles you ever bought we would buy the record the cheapest records available were the woolworths embassy series yeah, absolutely yeah. very well <laughs> so you'd get somebody that sounded a bit like cliff richard singing um, yes. I, it, he didn't do a worship in an idol. Me, who sang that? I don't know. You probably know, but uh, what's the what's of, no. worship in an idol made of rubies and stone? When you're worshiping a woman, 
whose love you cannot under anyway that's one of the ones i got from embassy it wasn't a cliff um and there was things like battle of new orleans uh, oh by, yes um, uh, johnny horton yeah, but it was somebody pretending it, to be. It, it, yes, <laughs> I'm sure it was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and so, but you'd get twice as much for your money. I mean, you know, instead of six and eightpence for a, for a single, it was three and sixpence. And yeah, for an album or something. You know. Yeah. So that's how we started with just music that was by nobody in particular. But the first actual record that by the time then we'd moved from Bradford down to. Um, I can't get this chronology right, actually, because I moved to so many different places. But I got into classical music in Bradford when I was about 10, when a leaflet came through the door um, from Concert Hall Records, telling me that I could have four free classical EPs, which for a bloke that got a shilling every week, pocket money, was that was sounded good. So I got my four EPs, which were, you know, things like Brahms Hungarian dances, uh, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> Bit of Romeo and Juliet, whatever, um, Tchaikovsky, that kind of thing. And then, of course, you had to buy it for 26 shillings, which was a, a, um, a lot of money in those days. In fact, I'm, <laughs> and, um, anyway, yeah. I'm going mad, going from Bradford to... Um, Winchester and I remember buying my first single in Winchester but when when we were in Bradford that's where I joined the uh, Concert Hall Record Club and then I got clobbered one time a year for 26 shillings which was pretty much Ooh. you know more than I could afford and the first album I had there was um, Schubert's Ninth Symphony by uh, conducted by Karl Schlurich and uh, the Stuttgart Radio Orchestra and I just fell in love with it and I used to pile up the, the chairs on the dining table when my mum and dad went out shopping in the on a Saturday morning. And I'd put it on, by then we had a radiogram, I think. And I'd put it on and I'd conduct it. And I'd, I'd put notices around going strings, shadows, <laughs> uh, oboes right in the middle, just to the left a bit. You know, and I would conduct my, my orchestra of uh, um, furniture doing Schubert's Night Symphony. I didn't have a score or anything like that. I just remembered, you know, and I learned that piece. I could do pretty much if they rang me up today and said, look, the conductor's ill. Can you come yeah. conduct Schubert's Night Symphony? I'd be able to do it probably. Because um, <laughs> I knew it so well. Anyway, the first actual single was the Springfields. Um, All right, okay. Uh, Island of Dreams. And oh, I remember yes, buying it on the lunchtime. We skived off on a lunchtime, didn't go to school lunches, when I was at Winchester at Peterson's School, where you weren't allowed to uh, leave, you know, at lunchtime. And we would. And um, I remember buying that. When are you talking about? This is late 50s, early 60s? Early 60s. Early 60s, early 60s it? yeah. Yeah, it would be... Yeah, because the Beatles happened in 62. 62. And I reckon that would be... That was when I was 12. Yeah. So, uh, so it was perfect timing for me. So when the Beatles came along, it was just after I... I can't remember whether the Springfields... That might have been 63-ish, probably. Yeah, yeah, I think it might have been uh, yeah. that one. Yeah. yeah I, I would have been about 13 then. Have you kept any of those old singles? Um, no. Uh, well, yes, actually. I have got boxes of old records, but most of them go back probably to my teens i've got i've got the early stones albums with my name on the back written in Absolutely. so you take them to parties <laughs> yeah. and make yeah. sure that you got them back and come back them, yeah. uh so, so i've got um some of those old stones stuff um but old singles i'm not sure what i've got i remember being very affected when i was about 15 maybe i was a bit late starter i don't know my first girlfriend of any note, um, left me standing on the steps of uh, in Winchester of, of, of the Theatre Royal, which was a cinema, when I was taking her to the pictures, you know, um, and she just left me standing there. And I, I sort of waited about an hour before I realised she wasn't going to turn up and trudged home. And the next day I went out and bought um, Roy Orbison, It's Over, 
Oh, God. Oh. <laughs> so every time you hear that, you're reminded of the Theatre Royal in Winchester. Oh, presumably. God, yeah. Oh, that's, that's so brilliant. That's, that, your brilliant orchestration as well, which, again... Absolutely. The whole idea of the orchestration on a, on a pop record. I mean, stri- people say the Beatles invented violins on records, but it went way back through the, before yes. Buddy Holly. Yeah. And, um, uh, Roy Orbison was a particular... Oh, what a heartbreaker. That really is. I love that. I love the memory of those times back in the early 60s when if you went to meet a girl, you always were meant to meet her outside the cinema or under the bus station clock. And there would always be a knot of people. This is, doesn't happen anymore yeah. since the mobile phone. There will always be a knot of very nervous looking anxious people looking at their up. watches. Yeah. The and and slowly the other person would turn up. Yeah. But there'll always be two or three people left behind. Oh, really? Yeah. Yes. It's like selection in a football match, isn't it? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the last one on the touchline that nobody wants. <laughs> I, I, I didn't observe it with quite such pithy um, uh, 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 wit. I just wanted my girlfriend to turn up, and she didn't. And that was, that oh, was that. Oh, the agony of youth. Me. You weren't the only one. You were. No. <laughs> but that's it's so funny that those records still soundtrack moments like that because they really do, don't they? You know, yeah. you, you can hear yeah. old. I was opera. so sorry for myself. You know, you, you, you just wallow in self pity at a time like that. And yeah. that's. Um, and you listen to the lyrics and you realize that they actually mean something. And it taught me a lesson for later in life when I became a. So I always wanted to be a, well, I didn't always want to be a songwriter, but I'd be, at some point I decided I wanted to be a songwriter. But how important lyrics are, I think we tend, guys tend, I think guys particularly, who, and it happens to be guys who program radio stations, tend to listen less to lyrics than women. And girls yeah. do listen. I mean, I okay, I've just proved myself wrong by talking about how much I was personally affected by Roy Orbison lyrics. But um, I've always been aware as a writer that very often it's the girl in the couple who will listen to the lyrics and say, oh, I really like that record. And then the guy will listen yeah. and say, oh, I, I like it too. Because Dave and I have worked together in various offices and we've always noticed that that uh, men and women have a different attitude to what's playing at the office. You know, girls will often say, this is nice. What is it? But boys will say, what is it? And if they're, if it's something that they think it's okay to like, they'll say, I like this, but they'll, right. they'll reserve judgment till they, they check till, who it is. Because they're very concerned about what impression that makes about them. That's it's interesting. very interesting. I never thought yeah, that. Yeah, but, girl, but girls don't feel like that. Girls, you know, wonderfully just think, this is good. I love it. Yeah, so but, so the guys are but, looking for permission to like it. Uh, yeah, uh, I think they yeah. are. I think they yeah, they, but, yeah. But isn't it also the case that records, it all seems to me from observation, the records that spend absolutely ages at number one tend to be quite slow, tend to be love songs, tend to have simple sentiments. Yeah. You know, I will always love you. Brian and, you know, Adams. Uh, Brian Adams. Yeah. Those, those kind of things. And uh, I, I couldn't help think that it was loads of people, probably mainly women, who take it as a plate, the lyric as applying to their life. Yeah. They can kind of borrow the lyric yeah. and, and cast themselves in the song, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, you're right. Um, I will the, survive being a good example of that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and those great big number one records are the ones that you can never get on the radio because they're too slow to play yeah. initially. Yeah. The yes. The user always says, I'm sorry, it's too slow. Um, yeah. I have that with bright eyes. You know, late. You know, I, I know whether we're, we're going to go. Cr- cr- Which not. you co-wrote, didn't you? I, no, I just wrote it. I mean, oh, you wrote I, it. Sorry, I thought you co-wrote it. Yeah, oh, right, yeah. For the movie uh, Watership Down. Yeah. I produced it for Garfunkel with, with him, as um, he obviously he was the singer, and that um, we couldn't get arrested with it. I mean, it. it really? I, I can tell it was. It was the only, probably about the only time I thought this. God, if I can get this played, this will be number one. And it just wasn't. And we were told to actually, um, are we allowed to say the words beginning with F and O? Well, it doesn't matter, I've said it now. Yeah, um, yeah. By Radio One, a bloke at Radio One uh, said, fuck off round to Radio Two with it. You can bleep this, he'll cut it out. And, um, <laughs> That's fine. 
I love the idea that fuck off right to Radio Two is the kind of ultimate damnation. <laughs> Be days, off to Radio Two with you. You know. In those days, it was because they couldn't break a record. Yes, it was. Radio Two. Radio Two. No. Everyone wants to be on Radio Two now, but yeah. you couldn't be on Radio Two and and have a hit in those days. They no. couldn't break a record. And Bright Eyes, we worked on them. And the record company had already dropped it. Uh, and a young promotion man who was going to leave. The publishing company, they had promotion men in uh, publishing companies. Yeah. This is in 1990. No, what am I talking about? 1979. Yeah. And uh, he was going to leave because the company wouldn't buy him a Ford Escort. That was, I remember it clearly. <laughs> um, for his company car. And they said, why does a promotion man need a company car? So he was going to leave. I said, Look, Neil, don't leave. Neil Ferris, his name was. Yeah, oh, we, know, Neil we Ferris. know Neil Ferris. Yeah, well, there you go. Ferret and Spanner. I, Lovely I, I guy. Like that, so you could jump on it and say so you knew him. Can we ask you about, because you, you got a job at Liberty Records, didn't you, in, when you were 18, I think? I did. Liberty, presumably at the time when they had the, the Bonzos and Idle Race, trying to think who else they would have had. Ainsley yeah. Dunbar, um, I don't know, Searchers. It, well, yeah, um, it, was, it was, a. of course, as you all know, it was the small set up setting up company in this country of a much bigger record company in america uh, they had the ventures uh, yeah. one of their biggest acts which was the of course the the shadows of america um, yeah and uh they, they were setting up here in in england and ray williams was there uh do you know ray at all he was he was around no, he's the Sorry? He was very instrumental in the early career of Elton John, wasn't he? Yeah. And Is that right? An uh, in NME, he took out an advert. Yeah. He was only 20, 20 years old himself, uh, uh, and he was a very smart man about town, sort of um, his Austin Reed suit on, and his, <laughs> he was uh, particularly, and he was extremely good-looking, this young A&R man. You think, well, you should be the pop star, not me. Yeah. And... Uh, he was like a younger, better looking version of Robert Redford. Right? <laughs> well, better looking than Robert Redford. In, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, honestly. And uh, he, he puts his advert in the NME saying, Liberty wants talent. Uh, it's a, a quite a famous advert, as you just said, because it's the one oh. that Elton oh, yeah. and Bernie both applied to. And on the same day that I applied, I wouldn't say we were sitting in the building on the same day necessarily. Well, it might have been, might have been in a reception and there was a bloke that I've never seen and he, I'm a bloke he's never seen and we might have been in the same reception area waiting to go and see this young A&R whiz kid. Anyway, Ray signed me to the production company. I played him a, a record of a, 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 I'd been going around record companies for, since I've been looking in my diaries, I couldn't believe I had gone to see so many different, I went to Decca, Pi, I had contact, I used to go and see Dick Leahy when he was a young a &R man. Dick Leahy who became the yeah. publisher and manager type person yeah. for uh, George Michael later, um, yeah. famous industry figure. But when he was a young, young man, I, used to, I went to see him at, 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 at Phillips Records. And then it, that was, I look back now and I think, well, that must've been when I was 17 and still at school because when I answered the advert, the Ray Williams advert at Liberty was must have been late in that year before I even took my A levels. Because but you became head of A and R, didn't you? Quite soon, and I think yeah. signed the Groundhogs. Is that right? Shall I pull out one of my, one of my? Go on. Yeah. yeah. I found this diary. It's just a desk diary, you know, like you'd have. Um, on your desk, you know, it's, it's yeah. not, a, not a journal, yeah. uh, not a ship's journal. I put a few, as you'll see, post-it notes in, not that we'll have time to talk about all of them, but I was only because I was amazed about, um, I had been, uh, let me see, I'd been, I'd been obviously, must have been to see Ray Williams in the year before this, this is his diary for 1968, and on the 4th of January, there, uh, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. I, can't see, right. I can't see my, I've got a little thumbnail of my picture up there. I can't see the Something meeting. Product, yeah. Product meeting 
brackets fading yellow, told of plans to record. Um, and th that was because I'd written a song called Fading Yellow, which was w the only decent song. Of it. it wasn't a bad song, actually. I played it the other night on the piano just because somebody asked me. And um, it, became, it was the B-side of my first single. But the, the, again, for the reason we've just been talking about with slow songs not getting radio play, right. it was decided that this song called Mr. Poem, which was a jolly up-tempo song, right. but nowhere near as sort of cool or any, not that Fading Yellow was cool. I mean, just, uh, I've never really been a, a searcher for being cool, or rather if I have, I've never succeeded. <laughs> and um, so, so that January the 4th, 1968 when I was I, and then there's a I thought well I, that was the year I took my A level so but I've got um, stuff massive stuff stuff throughout and then here's the big clue oh I've got my foot my first single is only marked by I, I just saw it this morning before you came on um, on a Wednesday in March, it just says two o'clock, single, Wessex Sound. That's all it says. All right. I, I, I could find it, but why would you need to see me, my writing saying that? That's all it says. <laughs> but no, no. Um, this is yours. <laughs> Sorry? But you made some singles yourself, and also, I mean, you and you work with, I'm, I'm just mentioning a name here, Hapsash and the Coloured Coat, who Dave and I was rather, yeah, rather liked. That and did all, you... that's, all, that's all contained in this magic. All right. Um, because I've then found that, because this is me meeting with the arranger, because it's the only record I've made that I didn't arrange myself, because, of course, as a new 18-year-old signing to the label, the, it was produced by Bob Reisdorf, who ran the label, uh, uh, by the way, when once Ray Williams had con connected Bernie Torpin with with Ray, Ray with um, sorry Elton, who was Reg then, and signed me, he then left ultimately to sign uh, to to manage Elton, and that's and he was right. the one who set up the Troubadour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got his job effectively. So. Sometime in the middle of 68, an A&R meeting heard one of my B-sides that I'd produced for my second single. And the, and Bob Reisdorf, the head of the company said, who, who produced this? And the guys in the meeting said, well, might produce it himself. So Bob said, why don't we give him a race job then? So yeah, at 19 years old, I would have been, or 18 actually, I was made, I got Ray's job, which you call it head of A&R, but if there's only one person in the A&R department, right, simultaneously yeah. the most junior and the most senior. So uh, it's impressive, it was, whatever. At that at that young age, that's amazing. It was a great learning thing for me. I hate the word learning curve, but it was a hey, it was a great learning process, and um, it was mad how many things were happening all at the same time. You know how you look at, back in a, in an old diary. And you remember that thing, you remember that thing, you remember that thing, but you don't remember that they all happened in the same way. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. sure. And I must have been running right mad because there's a great big hole in the middle of the diary where I was taking my A-levels, obviously. <laughs> and I'm coming back and then I've got a TV, I'm on a t t Tony Blackburn TV transmission in June, which is my first t thing I ever did on t as an artist. And I remember that TV show because that was where I met all the Elton lot again, down, um, down at Stan Phillips's house down in Andover, where people like Roger Pope and Caleb Quay, who played with Elton, right. they were in bands and stuff, and he managed the Trogs. And so that was, there's that. Um, but yeah, things like Hapshash, that literally came along because I'm sitting in my new office at uh, Liberty Records, and two things are going on in this diary that I, I find interesting. One is John Gilbert coming in, uh, who is the son of Louis Gilbert, the film producer. Right, yes. Uh, and the film director. And he was the manager of Family. And oh, okay. I, I was used to make my living just before they signed me as the producer, the guy, you know, A&R person, by doing the top lines 
every every publisher had to have you know every song written out uh, so the idle race for example the, me the melodies out. yeah and the idle race needed you know mr crow and sir norman whatever the song was and it had to be written down and that's what i did i got 10 shillings for doing it and that's how i made my money and john I, I did the, the family ones, and I'm in the office one day with John Gilbert, who happened to be the manager of this new band coming up, as everyone thought was going to be the next Beatles. Even the Beatles thought family were going to be the next Beatles. And uh, John just said to me, do you do string arrangements? And I said, actually, yes. Well, I didn't. I hadn't done one before, but I just lied. And he said, oh, well, I've got a 25-piece orchestra booked in a couple of weeks' time. 10 days time can you can you come and do the can you do the arrangements so i said yeah brilliant so i that's my first arranging job and talking of the beatles and, and family pop quiz here the the white album one of the original titles was a doll's house wasn't it it was and, and, I, and they uh, couldn't I, call it that because music in a doll's house came out about a month before i think am i right i won't miss bright 68 yeah yeah time was um it is compressed in this little book here because yeah I, I remember very clearly having been thrilled with my new job in my posh little office um in uh, albemarle street in mayfair and i inherited the office of the publisher head who was leaving and it was way above my station because it was a massive big office with picassos on the uh, not picasso originals but signed lithographs on the walls, uh, hello. And um, so I'm sitting in this office feeling a bit good and in comes <laughs> the, the Hapshash blokes because that, that they were, had been signed to the label. They'd had that red record out. Um, one of them, oh, anyway, to get to the White Album, I got to know the Hapshash people, which we can talk about, but, and we made an out, the second Hapshash and the Coloured Coat album, which I loved making, it was great fun. But while we were doing it, uh, Nigel Weymouth, who was the leader of the Hapshash. Yeah, he was a partner in Granny Takes a Trip, if I remember right. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, interesting guy. Very um, charismatic guy with the big hair and yeah. the granny glasses. And um, he, he became a very good painter and, uh, you know, as he went through his life, um, but he was a good painter then, but I'm just, he became quite well known as a paint, portrait painter, I think. Anyway, so Nigel came in um, and they, they were the cool guys and I, was, I felt very uncool. I, I just literally asked Ray Williams, where do you get your suits from? He said, oh, you should get yourself, get yourself um, a credit account with Austin Reed's. Uh, and he took me there and we opened a credit account and I bought my one suit that I had to go and be an a and man. And I had a box of cigars as well. Aged 18, I thought he needed a cigar. Oh, yeah. So I'd sit there with my white owl cigar and be an AR man. Anyway, in, in comes these <laughs> much cooler people who were Hatchet and Nicola Coat. And as I got to know them, a couple of weeks later, just coming back from a, a quick, you know, we had a nice cheap Italian um, uh, sandwich bar across the road, and we used to go there and they used to, they used to do lunch. And we'd have sausage and chips with me. I'd come back and he said, uh, Nigel said to me, I've got a tape uh, of the Beatles' new album. It was given to me yesterday and last night by Patty. Uh, he's talking about Patty. Boyd? Boyd. Patty. Yeah, Patty yeah. Boyd. George's okay. girlfriend, yeah. These guys moved in that set. They really did know the, the turf. They, they were just as Ray Williams did as well, because he was the Mr. Good-looking 20-year-old yeah. NR man. That this was a complete. I just, I literally trained up from Winchester. Uh, I was not a Londoner. I wasn't in the that thing. Uh, dope uh, made me sick, which was kind of useful um, in, in long term. Uh, it wasn't it was very disappointing, but it was um, useful long term. But um, meanwhile, back at that moment, uh, income. Nigel and a guy called Michael Mayhew, who was the other version, the other person, I used to say, in Hapshack and the Coloured Coat. And they said, I've got this record. And we sat there and we listened to a cassette of the Beatles' White Album. 
way before it was ever issued or anything like that. And we thought, wow, this is great. You know, we would, they were, you know, I, was being, I might have had a joint with them, I'm not sure. I can't remember. I didn't really do it though. So it used to say, yeah. it used to make me sick. So, uh, but they introduced me to the sort of, I never got to really get into it because that I had, as I say, I didn't live in London. I had my, uh, you know, I was basically I had a girl I was chasing and she lived in a flat somewhere else. And so I, I wasn't given to going out in the evening and staying up all night with, with all the people I worked with, um, which kind of maybe showed, you know, again, it was an uncool thing. If I'd, if I'd immersed myself yeah. in the community, it would have been a much more, yeah. much more easier ride at that time. But it got me to, in, into the, um, I really enjoyed doing those family arra arrangements. I mean, that is, there's a, a story about that actually that t probably takes too long to tell. I can have a go at it if you like. But the Hapshash record, again, where were we? It was, we had four track in those days. And the only studio in town that had eight track was Trident, which was it, just off um, Wardour Street. Yeah, and I remember seeing McCartney come out of it. I didn't know it at all then, uh, and um, I remember him walking down uh, with Mary Hopkin, walking down uh, St Anne's Court. It was called just yep. off. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Oh, you know it well. And uh, that was in those days when girls literally did. I was once walking down St Anne's Court, and the girl did lean out. Of the window and sh and shout hello sailor at me. <laughs> <laughs> what were you wearing? <laughs> <laughs> no, it did normal. happen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but that was that was not. Uh, presumably, it hadn't become a cliche by then. It was, must have been. You know, <laughs> and you, it basically, do you want to come up for a shag? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, of course, you walked boldly on, took no notice, <laughs> but. Um, it fascinated me, all these girls' names on the buttons as you went past. And I thought it was magic. I mean, the magic land, you know. It might have been the the the, the sort of Mike Bat equivalent of uh, uh, the wind in the willows, the deep, dark woods, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, meanwhile, back at, we've done Hap Shash and Colleague. Oh, yeah, I, I again, I've got too many stories, really, but... The, that that first um, family doing family was an experience for me because I had no piano uh, where I was staying. I was just dusting in someone's flat in St John's Wood, and they they were all university students. They went out during the day, and so I had the place to myself. And I just lay on the floor in one of the bedrooms and did the scoring. And I went home to my parents in Winchester to check it out on the piano. And I found a diary entry in my magic little book here, um, where it just says, in the afternoon, it says arranging. In the evening, it says family session. So I must have actually arranged a lot of it on the day, or some of it. Yeah. Which is the pattern of my life. I mean, I've always arranged right up till the very last minute of the, of the session, uh, beginning of the session. Yeah, yeah. But uh, anyway, so I turn up, um, and I got my, I had a really lovely girlfriend that I, you know, managed to, uh, you know, I was punching way above my weight. I've got this, you know, and so I took her with me to sort of uh, moral support, really, because the family were all surrounded by glamorous women and stuff like that. And they all smelled of patchouli oil. Yes. yes, I'm sure they did. <laughs> I bet they I did. Can, I can just feel that now, actually, <laughs> thinking about their record sleeves. But the smell of patchouli oil is a little kind of a wormhole in time, isn't it, through which it you can really drop is. straight really back. Is. If I just get the faintest hint of it, I'm, I'm taken back to 1969. I go and buy a copy of Oz. Absolutely. <laughs> and a pair of loon pants. Yeah, sassy bubble. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and you bought your military. I bought my military jacket from the back of Melody Maker um, for, for it was an actual from the green jackets. Uh, Brilliant. For our, and um, I went, I used to go and see probably it was the year before actually, but in Southampton Civic Centre, I used to go and see Jimi Hendrix, 
the move the first time they did it. I went to see Gene and Rock, Gino Washington and the Ram Jam Band. Yeah. Uh, God, this is really um, a sort of trip through memory lane, isn't it? But uh, <laughs> That's <actually>. the plan. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I knew that Dave Mason was producing that session, the family sessions. And Dave Mason at the time was a big star. He was the leader of traffic. And, uh, uh, you know, they just had Hole in My Shoe and uh, what else? And no, that was a great record, but it had ridiculous, I climbed on the back of a giant albatross. Um, <laughs> the, oh yeah, it's great record. Little girl. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Anyway, they were these daunting people I was going to be doing my conducting in front of because I was a I was scared I was gonna turn up and it was gonna sound terrible. Um, B there was the intimidation of the fact that it was Dave Mason producing, and that was it. I mean, it was with my first gig, and I remember buying a baton on the way to Olympic Studios. <laughs> so I didn't have one. Where so do you get a baton? I exactly. never thought of that. You can't do you buy it in the a musical shop. instrument shop? Is the, yes. Where do you get a baton from? Is that what you do? Well, okay. the best place that I knew to get them was in the mid, just off Oxford Circus. There's a place that does violins and stuff. I can't remember the name of it. Oh, I know, yes. Yeah, it's in Golden Square. Yeah. No, well, there's a resident Great Marble Street that, that so is it. used to yeah. sell violins. Anyway, whatever. Yeah, that's yeah. right. There are a couple of them around Oops, there. Cool. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you can buy a violin. In a music shop, they had a little card of them, usually. <laughs> and, and you can buy one and uh, I've now got I, I, when I go to sessions to conduct orchestras I've, I've got that many I've got about 20 batons half of them are broken some of them are and I pick them up pick one out you know for the session while while the orchestra's in the room I'll, I've got my little tube full of batons and I'll pull one out a bit like pick, choosing your weapon for a yes <laughs> it's hilarious fencing it's like fencing yeah you've got yeah. a quick quiver full of batons Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So presumably at this session, you're standing up in front of a bunch of, I always have a vision of orchestral players who've turned up for that session that day as a faintly disapproving bunch of rather intimidating older men. Is that the case? Without the word faintly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because they're sitting there thinking, I'm, I'm normally playing Schubert and I'm now lowering myself to, to join into the, the pop world, you know. Not and some that. bloke in a turtleneck sweater with long hair in front of me, uh, smoking hey, look, a cigarette, is in charge. Long hair, but only 18 years old, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Why are we doing this? You know, lowering ourselves. Uh, it was it used to be like that. Nowadays, it's it's much nice. There are much cooler people in, in, in orchestras. Um, and there were some nice people then as well, I have to admit. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there in Abbey Road when McCartney got the, the orchestra to put on false noses and wigs and things, you know, to That's try to the, loosen yeah. them up? It's yeah. hilarious. But there were some very, very nice um, orchestra players and people. In fact, what, one of my other artefacts, which I thought was quite fun to find yesterday, uh, Go on. I through a story. I, 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 let me finish my story about the um, family. So, so I got on the podium, I met everyone, and of course, it, not of course, but... Uh, the control room at Olympic was lined with beautiful women, all smelling of patchouli and smoking dough. <laughs> and I'm completely intimidated by all this because um, basically women have always ruled most of the decisions of my life. Uh, and um, uh, so I, um, I, I go down and um, start, uh, I don't know why I even mentioned that, what, it's got nothing to do with women, it's all to do with music. Anyway, so we go down. I went down, and I, I've got the string section in front of me, and I did the. Ch there's a, a song called "The Chase," another song called "Mellow in Grey," which were both required strings, and I had done arrangements on. And actually, with strings, as long as you get, as long as the notes sort of don't clash against the chord too badly, um, it, you can get away with it if you don't know an awful lot about it. It. it I don't mean if you don't know, but if I if one doesn't know. And uh, so they, they, they find a sort of balance, you know, so if you've got, you've got, you've, you've overwritten one part, the other part tends to balance up. Somehow it, they find their own, a bit like a choir, they settle into their sound. Yeah. But with brass, brass are much more daunting to write for because they sound louder, 
and if you make a mistake, it's it is this. much more yeah. of a howler. Yeah. Anyway, to, the, so the strings left, and I, and I, w I was quite happy with what I'd done. It was amazing. I was, you know, not euphoric, but at least, well, you know, that's, that went okay. So in come the, the brass, and it turns out that the, not that I knew uh, uh, until someone told me, the leader of the sax section was Tubby Hayes. Oh, um, grief. Jazz That's intimidating enough on its own. <laughs> yeah. Um, and trumpets and you know, I think I had a baritone, a couple of tenors, a couple of altos, probably three trumpets and a couple of trombones would be it. And uh, there's a song called Old Songs, New Songs, which we started, yeah, yeah. which was the, the session. Uh, what the family had asked for was four big major chords at the beginning of, of the piece and then do what I like, build it up into a big sort of nightclub sort of atmosphere, big city type of sound in it, uh, for the fade out at the end. And so I started, I mean, brought up this brand new baton, brought it down again, and this horrendous noise came out. It wasn't a major chord, it was a some sort of weird major ninth that I'd accidentally written because I'd forgotten to transpose the B flat instruments in the in the brass section. So all of the saxes were wrong. The E flat instruments, the baritones, they were in the wrong. Key. Very psychedelic. Would have worked really well. Well, funny you should say that because that's exactly what they thought. <laughs> they thought, oh, let's keep it. I'm there going, oh my god, what's going to happen? I'm going to be. You know, thrown out, and uh, the Beatles did this deliberately all the time. Yeah, he came running down out of the box because I stopped it because I knew the rhythm section were going to come. I say the rhythm section, the band were going to come in any moment playing, and uh, I'd get sussed, and then I'd, you know, but he came down and said, "Brilliant, that's fantastic." You know, sounds like Bartok. You know, I thought, <laughs> well, brilliant. Okay, fine. So it taught me to take a few risks later on. I've, I've written lots of sort of quite crazy stuff. But um, the thing that ha was good that happened was Tubby Hayes, contrary to the kind of musician that you just described, which was, i.e., you know, why are we lowering ourselves to the, yeah. these brass musicians? They could, they realised I wasn't, I don't know, for some reason, they, they saw that I wasn't, that, well, they were just nice guys, I suppose, because he just said, Leave it to us, you know, we'll sort it for you. We'll just play it in the right key. So they just transposed oh. it. Oh, very nice. That's lovely. Yeah, and they saved my life. They saved yeah. my skin. And um, so I just waved my new baton up and down um, and all the way through the track. And it sounds great on the record. But the first, to this day, the first four um, rather limp sounding uh, chords of, the, of that arrangement uh, are still on the record just on their own, and then in comes the rhythm. Well, look, if it isn't too massively clumsy a gear change, we must talk, as you alluded to them uh, earlier on uh, in your thing about living near Wimbledon, about the Wombles. Uh, and so tell us a little bit about that. I mean, you, you, you originally were offered a fee to do it and decided you would take a, 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 a character rights for the characters in the children's TV yeah. program. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Um, and to prove I'm not... Um, I don't, I don't mind talking about them. There's a little... That's, that's one of my very, old, very good. Card, um, with, it's got the wombles on them. Um, that's me there. Anyway. That's great. Oh, hold it up. We didn't see that. you got to hold it up. Hold it up, hold it up to the camera. A bit higher. Sorry, higher. So we still can't... See. There we are. There and that's you. Oh, yeah. Which one were you? Uh, I'm that one. Orinoco. Orinoco. Okay. Chris Spedding was that one? Is Chris Spedding one of them? <laughs> Chris Spedding was one of them, wasn't he? Well, it, Chris Spedding. Not live, all probably. Records, all the records that had guitar on had Chris on, which was most of the records. I mean, we made about 50 tracks because we had four albums. And it was Clem Catini on drums. It's Clem Catini, the those Kinks records and Dusty Springfield records. It's wonderful that he was a one. Yeah, he was just such a solid drummer. That's why everyone yeah. wanted and he had great steady timekeeping. And, and he, in those days, it mattered how hard you hit the bass drum uh, and consistently. Otherwise, you wouldn't get a good sound. Yeah. Because nowadays, you can just put a sample in and you're okay. You can replace it with a sample. But in those days, 
Um, and that's why Clem was, was so much in demand. He had a big powerhouse. He wasn't namby-pamby, sort of jazzy-wazzy. He was heavy duty. Um, and so was, so was Chris. Yeah. And uh, he, he was, uh, yeah, but the tr it's true. I did, um, I've, whatever the far past is of forego, I forewent my fee and said, uh, look, I'd rather have the rights, if you don't mind. To, what a to good decision to make records and stuff. Cause I like the characters. I'd like to write more songs. And they went, oh, fine, no problem. And uh, so, oh, sorry, my phone's dinging. And so they, they said, fine. And, and I um, then made the record. Uh, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't brimming with work uh, to the extent that I could afford to, to splash out. I was, I was making, I'd left Liberty by then. I was making my living writing commercials and trying to do singles and doing brass arrangements and stuff for people. So I was freelancing basically. And uh, so I'd make, but I would make records with what was going to be the rent money. And what you would do, I used to call them rent records. You'd make the record and hope to get to a record company in order to, to sell it to the record company to get the money back before your landlord chucked you out of the flat. And that was, that was what, that was a, the first, the first Womble record was a rent record. It was uh, it, rent record sounds terrible. It sounds like rent voice, doesn't it? Yeah. it nothing to do with that. It was just the fact that it was the rent money that you were using to um, to make the record. I wrote a piece in uh, Smash Hits. You might remember this, Dave. Uh, uh, enthusing, evangelising about the Wombles and about oh, really? uh, about the minuetto, allegretto, and wombling white tie and tails. Saying how oh, fantastic it was, 1981. Nice. But I mean, just, how did you sit down and write a song like "Wombling White Tie and Tails"? I mean, where, how do you start a thing like that? Where did you get an idea like that from? Wombling White Tie and Tails. Well, that one I remember specifically was I on Sunday afternoons. The BBC ran a series of old Fred Astaire movies. Yeah. Every Sunday afternoon, that's the one would come on. Yeah. And I just thought they were great. And um, I thought, well, the Wombles could do that. The thing about the Wombles is that whereas other bands that were in the same commercial, looking for the same chart positions, you know, at the time, the contemporaries of the Wombles were the Bay City Rollers, Mud, Sweet, you know, apart from the Bowies and that kind of people, kind of sort of slightly cooler acts. But, um, Whereas they had to stick more to the same sound each record. So the Bay City Rollers, Boom Shang Alang, whatever it was they had. Yeah. I'm not knocking it at all, but it had to be the same sound yeah, each record. Yeah. yeah. If the Wombles came out with, with a waltz each time, they'd be going, oh, why do we need another Womble record? We've had yeah. a novelty record. And I was trying to build it, and we had eight singles in the end that were all eight top 40 singles. So I kept the sort of momentum going by changing the style of the record each time. So, okay, Underground Overground was the first one, but um, Remember Your Womble was the second one. And that was just a sort of shuffle with a kind of fiddle, as you remember, my, I know you don't need me to describe it to you, but it was different enough from the first one. And when, when it got to sort of, after a few hits, um, I was looking at all, I was almost treating it as an exercise in, as I didn't go to university or music college or anything, teaching myself to arrange music. Yeah. So I had all my books. In fact, again, another of my little attic -y things I've got here is my, where is it? I can't find it. Um, a, a sort of arranging book. Oh, here, here you go. First ever one I've had, which was Sounds and Scores by Henry Mancini. All right. <laughs> uh, which is how to basically how to arrange music. And, <laughs> Very good. Yeah, um, uh, that's the actual one I've had. Uh, 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 it's been bound. It fell to bits. It's come and it for me nicely. But I had all sorts of orchestration books, and that particular one is the one that enabled me to do the Fred Astaire sound because yeah. it teaches me how to write for closely written saxophones and big band and stuff like that. And, and I was just thirsty and hungry to learn all the different kinds of ways of, of arranging. So uh, the Wombles was perfect for me because the very necessity to have to change 
from single to single, style to style, it meant I could be as adventurous as I wanted to. Whereas I had, I had pals later on, a you know, well-known heavy duty pop star, rock star pals, I won't name names, but who said, oh Mike, you know, I wish I could, not, this wasn't by the way at the time, just because they just saw that in my career after that, I did a lot of different things. I wish I could switch around like you do from style to style. I mean, that didn't mean they were so able to, musically, that capable. They meant they wish they were allowed by their yeah, fans. Sure. To yeah. Uh, and I, I thought, actually, that, that's quite an interesting. I take that as a. The, the fact was the Wombles allowed me to do that. They allow me to do Minuetto Allegretto, as you said, one minute, and yeah. White Tie and Tails the next minute. And How did you feel reading um, Pete Perfidi? Because you played at Pete Perfidi's uh, book launch for uh, Broken Greek. Wonderful. And oh, yeah. uh, how do you feel when you read his book? And there's a whole generation of people who are his age, you know, who grew up, who are really young listening to the Wombles, you know, and, uh, and they meant a great deal. You must have been very thrilled to see somebody write about them with so much affection, really, and um, make it yeah. clear they were such a big part of their lives. It's, it's nice when that happens, and, and, and it's happened more over the years, to be honest with you, because at the time, it was it, the, you know, established rock press, a uh, present company. Uh, <laughs> don't, don't, don't worry. You don't have. <laughs> you know, I, it, it, you know I, it was just the Wombles, wasn't it? It wasn't it was, uh, yeah. on, on grey whistle test. Well, mind you, the Wombles... Didn't particularly Don't mean. tell me the music press were more keen to write about Roxy music than they were about the Waffles. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> yeah. yeah, so what kind of were, people were they? It, it was uncool, but uh, it was fun. And fun is very often uncool. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I, I think the Beatles made me uh, had a quite a lot of fun, and the Beach Boys had quite a lot of fun. Um, but, yeah. uh, you know, nobody really knows about other people very much um by by that i mean i there i was as a womble but i was being but the rock press of the time wouldn't know that i was carrying the same uh jimmy hendrix records around when i was 17 as they yeah. were i was just yeah. as much into josh white's empty bed blues as they were except that i i changed it into empty tidy bag blues and voted for the wombles <laughs> <laughs> but you must be very grateful, apart from the success that it had, that it's kind of been a calling card for you ever since, though, hasn't it? The people still are, you know, it's very famous, the Wombles, and you're very famous via the Wombles. Is that well, fair it, to say? It's nice, that, but it's also, um, it has a, a, a kind of, I don't know, um, there's... Uh, at least up until now, it, it's certainly turning that way now. Pe people are remembering it with a lot more affection than I got praise at the time. And um, and yet, it, it's slightly irking sometimes to be, um, but this is the same with uh, most people, um, to be identified with the very first thing that you had any success with, which was... Yeah. 50 years ago, something like that. And and I've done a lot of things since then, which you, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're, you're aware. But um, sometimes I think, think, oh yeah, I'm still the Mr. Womble, you know. And I, I don't, I actually don't have any problem with it. They've, they've enriched my life. I don't mean financially, but that too. They, they've, uh, they've, um, my mum made the costumes, all of them. Um, when, when, the, when the Queen Mum was a hundred, we, we were invited to be part of the ceremony that we marched past the, the Queen Mother's, you know, saluting base with 16 guardsmen wombles. And my mum made all the costumes with a little squad of little old ladies that came round to our house and made all these great big Busby type, you know, bearskins. And, um, big red costumes and, and I got some boys from the boys uh, brigade and drilled them, remembering all my drill moves from when I was company sergeant major at of the CCF. 
and um, we marched past and, and it was on the front page of all the papers. It was brilliant. And, you know, if you've got a sense of fun, I mean, for example, Gla Glastonbury, am I talking too much? I seem to be... No, 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 no go on, go on. Um, in 2011, we did um, a, a one-hour live set from within the costumes. I mean, and I was... Even in 2011, I was quite old. And what's it like playing inside a Womble costume in the in the blazing heat and the Vale of Avalon? I wish one surely a little bit sweaty in there. It was sh very sweaty. You're, you're, <laughs> you're absolutely right, Mark. It was um, 50, fifty something degree. No, it was hot. Uh, it was hot I don't anyway. Know it, was was. it was very very hot. It was like yeah. something in the shade. And that we had to arrive and then get into a Womble costume. So you add that onto the extra heat of, you know. And so literally, we sweated buckets, but not never wanted to go to the toilet because we just sweated it all out. We we <laughs> were drinking water out of bottles, you know, sort of mess on the slide. I had two teams of of identically dressed Wombles, two drummers, two bass players, uh, two guitarists, two Wellington because Wellington was the guitar player and he had a flying V like Chris Spedding, yes. and um, it just happened that our, our one, oh, the first guitarist we had in the Wombles, who did the live gigs, which was different from the session guys, was Robin Le Majurier, who ended oh, up- yeah. Oh yeah, he was in Rod Stewart's band. That's right. Yeah, he was uh, the son of John Le Majurier, wasn't he? He was, son of Hattie Jakes and uh, yeah. John Le Majurier. Yeah. And he's a brilliant guitar player and lovely bloke. Anyway, so he's been associated with it all. But Chris did the sessions. Anyway, so we had a guy with a um, with a flying V being Wellington, and he'd give the flying V to someone else dressed up as Wellington. But I was the only one in the band, because I was the lead singer at Glastonbury, who had to not have a double, because I had to sing the same as each song the same, you know, the yeah. same voice. So, um, and at the in you know, 2011, I was, you know, 60 something, two, three. Uh, and um, so it was, it was, um, it, it, let's just say rather exhausting, but the whole point <laughs> I'm making about it was that and it took me an hour to recover afterwards. I sort of sitting there just drinking water and people <laughs> bringing bring, bring me bottles of water with my warm costume half off. And, uh, but the joy of it, I mean, the people loved it. They they tre they trekked over from the other stages and whatever. It was a muddy afternoon, but sunny. And we got the. They have a at Glastonbury. They've got. Um, a, they give you. A, I think it's the colour. It, it goes red for the biggest crowd at that moment in, on the site. We had the biggest crowd of the Sunday afternoon. Yeah. Uh, in, That's in so great. Glastonbury. Um, I think we, well, we were on the Avalon stage, so that's about the third biggest of the stages. That's wonderful. And I love the idea, though, that Pete's, in Pete's book that he, he put so much thought into your lyrics. There's a bit where he's, I don't know, he must have been about five or six at the time, when uh, it was underground, overground, wombling free, the wombles of Wimbledon, common are we. And he yeah. thought this was a song about class. He thought yeah. there's, there's the rich people there, the upper middle class, and then there's the Wombles who are working class, you know, yeah. out on the common at Wimbledon. Oh, that was fantastic. I know, that's great. And um, oh, Pete's, Pete, the thing I like about Pete is, is his complete lack of, um, of that urge to be cool. And, yeah. and he's completely able to um, admit what, what, mind you, he's starting out from being a child, and children are rarely cool, but he's very honest about his thoughts. Well, no, it's just that people don't tend to acknowledge how much kind of uncool things meant to them when they were young. The Rubets he writes about, doesn't he? You know, yeah. uh, uh, sure Brotherhood of Man, you know, Abba, you know. I think that's wonderful, because they've meant so much to you at the time. And I love the idea that he said, was it Abba himself? Was it Abba or was it somebody else? He wanted, he thought it'd be good if they would adopt him. Yeah, Brotherhood of Man. Yeah. He, oh, that's right. He thinks his parents don't like him anymore because he's not as cool. They th he, he thinks his parents are, have become really fond of little Jimmy Osmond because little Jimmy Osmond is kind of socially integrated and funny and confident and he can sing and dance and tell jokes. 
Oh, and Pete just thinks they really love little Jimmy Osmond, and I'm an absolute failure as a son. So they're gonna they're gonna get rid of me. So I yeah. need new parents. How about the Brotherhood of Man? It's brilliant. a lovely story. Yeah, uh, it, actually, Jimmy Osmond, Osmond, even though he comes out badly in Pete's book, is a really a really nice bloke. <laughs> I met him. I met him in a Madonna concert. Yeah. He's a lovely guy. <laughs> Yeah. But, uh, you yeah. met little Jimmy Osmond I did. And Madonna. Yeah, Madonna at Wembley. Yeah, yeah. I, how come was he just sitting next? They were sitting in the same little enclosure. We had full had free tickets from whatever it would have been Warner Brothers Records or somebody. Who was their record company? Yeah. And did uh, he, did he, he, he lean row. over and say, "I'm little Jimmy Osmond"? No, no, I recognised him. I thought I've got to go and talk to him. And uh, you he was recognised. Just... I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, Mike. I've got to. You recognise Jimmy Osmond at the age I, of what in his fifties or something? Well, yeah, he would have been, wouldn't he? What forties? Isn't it? When was? <laughs> yeah, it was in the nineties, I think. But I didn't recognise. I thought I've got to go and say hello. Why not? You know, he was sweet, <laughs> lovely <laughs> boy, yeah, amazing yeah. teeth, dazzling teeth. I've known him since he was about thirty, maybe. He came to my house in London, and we were going to do some records and stuff together. And I went down to meet him at the Hilton. Uh, Trader Vicks underneath. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, oh, yes. Um, yeah, as mentioned in a, in a Warren Zevon song. Warren Zevon song. Yeah. Yes. yeah. But um, it's funny, you just bump into people and you just, you know, keep in touch or not. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like, you know, and... Uh, what what are you working me. on at the moment, Mike? What have you been doing right. during... Like, what are you working on at the moment? What have you been doing during the last few months? Well... Um, I've been busy, actually. Uh, I don't mean frantically busy, because there's a sort of... I don't know whether you've felt it, but I've found I don't get as much out of each day as I would if there was lots happening and people around and me going in and out for meetings. Uh, you know, but um, I, I have had, I've, I've had this one big um, project on which uh, it's actually a bit top secret, but it's a French artist, a new French artist I'm right. um, excited about. And I've been working on creating this album. This has got a particular character to it. And I know I'm, set, I'm sort of setting up questions that I can't answer. But anyway, it's a new project, new artist. Um, and I've been asked to get involved with it. But it, all this happened about the time we were moving house around about February, March, just as COVID was setting in. So yeah, I'm yeah. in my little room here, which is my writing room, but it's also these days, I'll just show you here. This is my, that's where I write. So that's my, that's oh, my new wow. screen. Oh my God. Uh, oh my goodness. God, that's huge. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's, that's my studio I'm in. And uh, I, 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 I've been arranging and a bit, I've written a set of, Oh, hang on. Uh, can you? Yeah, uh, something popped up. A bunch of uh, emojis popped up. On, uh, Sorry, on we can screen. see you. Don't worry. Yeah. You're all um, you're visible. You're visible. So I've been arranging, and I wrote a, a set of nine or ten songs uh, for the for the um, uh, for the album with, with this new artist. And uh, so, I mean, I, I haven't told you very much, have I? I've just told you I'm doing something I can't. No, but that's about. that's fair enough. Know, that it's a French something. singer. Yeah, yes, that's yeah. good. That's it's something. Great. Um, and it's, been, it's, it's kept me busy. It's kept me absorbed. Kept me interested. But I say, you know, you, there's this, still this level, isn't there, of kind of, oh, you know, can't, that you can't go out very much. And yeah. you know, I don't want to be negative. I'm, I tend not to be a negative type of guy. But the, the, there is an underlying. Is depression the right word? It's it's as if the it's it's. As, you know that feeling that we, we've all got at the moment, which is it's it, it it's slightly just anxiety, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you jolly yourself out a bit and get on with it, and it's unlucky that I've got work to do. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's part of, part of part of the reason why we do these things to it's jolly it. people out of it. Yeah, think. just to just provide <laughs> your entertainment, really. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Well. Should we have the greatest record day? Yeah, go on, go we on. We always traditionally idea. end, I think I said in my email to you, uh, Mike, that we traditionally end with, with uh, a nomination for the greatest record ever made. Yeah. So I've what seen, would I've, you... I've seen a few of your, you know, your things and, and uh, you know, I saw the Tim Rice one, the Billy Bragg one and a couple of others. Yeah. And, and, and I, I, 
every time you get to that question for them, I don't, I've forgotten how they answered it. Oh, well, Tim Rice answered it with a Delta Shannon record or something. Yes, anyway, I think it was. Runaway, Runaway, I think it was. Yeah. Wasn't it? That's right, yeah. And, and I thought, there isn't, I've got to be honest about this. I'm going to just stand up for my rights and say I can't tell you because there is, but uh, of course. <laughs> Oh, that's that. No, no, that's no, that's somebody phoning you to tell you that's the wrong answer. Yeah, well, <laughs> you, you have to come up with something. There is no wrong answer. <laughs> uh, well, and I thought to myself, there's got to be something. And I, I just give us a record you really love. It's never let you down. Yeah, I'll do that because because it depends what genre you're talking about. Because if you're going to say the reason that the reason I'm just you can cut this out of it if you think it all it's all too. Um, stupid because there are so many genres of music i mean the best record to somebody is not going to be the best record to somebody else which no, is the reason no, no 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 it's a personal thing it's your a record that you've loved all your life and never let you down oh my god um i, I i'm if i'm gonna just go a record that i really love is there goes rhyming simon by paul simon that's a Terrific. great record it's a fabulous record remember that uh, it was it shortly after they split, uh, and it was just when I was starting at, working at CBS, and Dan Loggins was head of A&R there, and I remember picking a, it was a free copy, so I can't claim to have gone and bought it for some emotional reason, Yeah, but I just sat and listened, it's got wonderful songs on it, like um, American, American, American tune. tune, One Man's um, Ceiling is Another Man's Floor. Yeah, just wonderful, and it's just a songwriter, not overproduced. No. Um, his first outing after the, I think it was his first outing. No, it was his second solo. Um, and um, that's just, just wonderful craftsmanship and, as, as, and songwriting, but sincere as well as commercial. And um, that's a combination, of, a magic combination is to be able to get a sincere. That's a great choice. Oh, a really good choice. Good. It's been lovely to talk to you. Fantastic. And good luck with your mystery, uh, mystery French singer. And uh, all the other projects. And uh, yeah, well, it's been great talking to you. I, as I say, I'm, I'm glad I got over that best record ever made moment without um, <laughs> losing my stripes. Word in your attic: A Zoom with a view.